Welcome everyone, it's so great to be here at Slash and it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you, Yuha, today, who has over the past six years been building his company into a global leader in quantum computing with over 280 employees. So I'm sure, Yuha, you'd agree with me that hiring remains the number one challenge for startups globally across all different sectors, but it's particularly challenging for deep tech startups. Quantum, for example, the number of job postings outpaces the number of candidates, almost one, three to one, according to McKinsey. So it's a real challenge that these startups are facing right now. So if you take your mind back six years ago when you were starting to build your company, how did you approach hiring technical talent? Uh, yeah, thanks, Leah. Uh, means a lot for me to, to, to come here and sit here and, and see the big stage. Uh, we started uh, six years ago, that was my first slash. Uh, in that time, uh, uh, we were nobody. We were, we were like a four, four founders and, and, and a business cards, started from scratch. Uh, and, and as you said, uh, hiring is the most important thing, what you need to do in the beginning of the company or when, you are st when you're starting to collect the, the extended founding team, but also in the later stages. So, Every hiring, especially when you're hiring leaders, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, having a very strong impact later on. So uh, in, in, in very early stages, uh, uh, the hiring is, is not, not so much about selecting people, but it, it's more like uh, marketing. You, you, are, uh, you have to convince, convince the best people around you uh, so that uh, your idea is the winning one. Uh, you have to... You have to uh, tell a good story. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to tell the story for the investors, but you have to also convince the, the, the first people uh, so that they, they will follow you, they will join the team in, in, before you have uh, anything. So uh, that's one of the, the crucial moments what you have to do. So you're essentially selling yourself to you know, potential candidates for, for jobs. So what does that look like when you're actually speaking to these these people who are, you know, have PhDs, have a lot of experience, and who could be earning a lot of money in a big corporation somewhere. How do you convince them to join your mission? Uh, so, uh, fortunately, we are living in a time when, when it's uh, the younger generation. They they appreciate the purpose in their job more than than maybe the high compensation. So when you are a young startup, you you don't afford paying uh, very high compensations, uh, uh, but but you can you can give a purpose. So you can you can uh, uh, like dream together. So you can you can pose a question. So like, what would be the best possible future? How would the success look like? And 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 then then you start dreaming together that one, and then you can you can like agree that okay, let's do that together. So you can you can build a team and, and work together and and uh, of course then you can also you have a luxury of maybe giving some shares or options and and kind of uh, building a common goal and and uh, working towards that and uh, that that works if your vision is is clear and and you all agree that you, if you are transparent and and you build in the trust among all of you. Yeah. So you said that in the early stages, it's about marketing yourself to, to potential employees. Where, where do you find them? Is it going to universities? Are you going to other startups? How do you source these potential employees? Uh, <clears throat> First off, you have, to, you have to approach those ones you know and, and who you trust already. So uh, like... Uh, our team, uh, we coming from university, so so we already knew a uh, number of uh, quantum researchers there, and uh, and and we knew the preferences. We knew who are good ones and and who who, who we would like to have in a company. So so that's uh, like uh, contacting each and every of your friends and and uh, kind of who you know there and 
tell your story, try to convince them. And actually, that was surprising. So uh, over, over the, let's say, the, the period of uh, raising our funds, it took almost one year in that time. So we were able to convince uh, like 20 people to join IQM in that early time. Like, uh, like, let's say that when we get the funding, do you join the company? And, and we were able to get like, like uh, about 20 people who committed, we will do it. Apart from one, all of them joined eventually. So uh, that was a kind of a, kind of a very positive surprise for me. When, when the, we got the funding, we were able to start paying salaries. So, so with, the, with this small founding team, we were doing like a first year uh, like a preparations. Then we had about 20 people joining us. And, and then we started like, uh, to grow like uh, normal companies. And then actually COVID came. So it's a kind of another story, but it's a... Yeah. So it's all about having a strong mission, being able to, to really articulate to, to people in the, in the job market exactly who you are and what you're trying to do. Yes. Uh, like, yeah, it's like uh, when, when you start doing anything, you should keep the end in the mind. So, so you should have a big goal, what you want to reach. And then you can, you can talk to people and, and of course, your idea, your initial idea is not necessarily the, the very right one. So, so you have to talk to people. They are smart people. You, you listen to them, and, and they, then you learn from them, and, and you develop your idea. And, and then you, when you knock, talk to the next one, you have already a bit better. So, so you keep on developing the idea, and, and then you have a, like a lot of different angles. And actually, then your idea gets more sophisticated, and you can have a better dialogue on that. And eventually, once you have built it, then your story is very strong. It's convincing. Uh, but it's not only about the goal, but it's only about the values. So, so, uh, so people want to work a certain way. Uh, so they want to, like, uh, actually the, the re researchers, uh, uh, PhDs in quantum, they, they want, the, usually they are very ambitious. So their they goals are, uh, they already setting very high goals for themselves. So, so when, you, when you ask them to commit to very ambitious goals, they are very keen on doing that. But then, uh, then there are maybe some, some other, like, it depends on the company. Uh, but you, you have to think about what are your values, how you are going to get, get there, mm -hmm. and discuss that among the people. And, and if, if the values match very well, the company values match to those ones of the individual, then people feel like uh, they belong to the, this team, and then they are ready to sacrifice a lot to, to reach those goals. Yeah. So obviously that's kind of in the, in the early stages. But as your company grows, how does your approach to hiring or your needs change with kind of the growth of your company? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, there, there are like, a, mm, like you have only like limited time available uh, for, for everything. And when you, you, when you have a growth company, there are so many things to do. So uh, uh, that means that you can't as a founder anymore control everything. Uh, and, and, and then uh, the key word is uh, trust. So you have to hire a team so that you can trust on that. So you can use your organization to, to reach the goals. So uh, that the same also applies to the, the hiring. So uh, well, I was myself hiring, uh, or I was participating to hiring the first 100 people uh, to IQM, and it's a, it's a lot, of, lot of work. You have to you have to have a lot of interviews. But I think that's uh, something with space back. And, and when you hire someone, you learn to know him or her. And, and you, like, uh, I, I think the, during this recruitment process, you, you learn to know the people and, and learn to trust. You, and, and, and trust is both ways. So you, the another one also learns to trust you. Yeah. And you, you kind of uh, make a relationship there. And, and you have to use that relationship later on in later stages. So you have to trust you know the people, you ask them to do something, they will deliver. And uh, that's the key. So uh, later on, they will recruit or hire the next, next people and so on. But you, you communicate your 
values, your intentions, you both share the same goal, mm -hmm. and, and then you trust that they will, everybody will do their job. Mm -hmm. So really, it's about getting those early employees right. Because yeah. if you then get those employees right, they then continue the hiring process, and you can trust that they will in turn hire the right people. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's maybe a little bit controversial. So. Uh, uh, but usually these early employees, or many of them, uh, become like a team leaders or leaders, people leaders, and then they, they will hire more people. Uh, and and uh, the skill set needed in the very early stage is, is slightly different than later on. So you're usually in, a, in the very beginning, you have to make your tech working, but you have to have a lot of other things also settled down. So usually you hire like a generalist in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So someone who can do whatever. Right. And, and where in the later stages, you hire more like a professionals who are specializing to particular roles. And, and then that's actually a big change process than what you have to, to, to live over. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, because I would have thought it would be the other way around. You hire your experts first, and then you hire your generalists. But it's interesting that you actually, you know, uh, need to find that balance of technical expertise with somebody who can actually run and build a business. Yeah, so um, that's, that's my way to do it. So uh, if you have, if, if you only hire like a technical specialist in the very beginning, you end up having like, a, your company becoming a fully R&D organization. And then you keep on developing your technology, your product, then you maybe run out of money, you haven't sold anything. So uh, at the same time, you have, to, you have to build your business, you have to build your marketing, you have to build your HR organization, you have to build all and everything. And uh, you have to do that with the people you have in a company. If you have all of them uh, specialists, then might be a hard time of covering all and every subject. Mm -hmm. so, uh as you grow and hire more people, last year you, uh, IQM announced that they were expanding into the US. And that's a, a different kind of challenge, I guess, with, with hiring. So how do you grow and hire for a team where you have you know, no presence on the ground? Uh, yeah, so we are uh, in the point of uh, expanding to both to, to US and to, and to Asia. Uh, so uh, we, we have also... Uh, business developers in, in Singapore and Japan. And, and uh, we are expanding now US, having a very strong plant there. So our team uh, have made, uh, made uh, we actually, we are scientists, so we do it planned way. And, and we did a research. So uh, we, we, we interviewed some Finnish company who have done it successfully. And, and what are their recommendations? What went right, what went wrong? And uh, actually, there was like a one, one recommendation above the other. So founder have to go to East Coast. That's the way to go to US. So what is the more, let's say, attractive way to go to US is, is to have a higher gun in West Coast. So Silicon Valley, where everything happens, hire American guy there, and he will do the job. But uh, actually, that's very risky way to do it. So, uh, so that was the recommendation that uh, uh, someone uh, who is loyal to the company, who brings the company culture uh, to the US, should go to the East Coast. There are different time zones. Uh, so let's say New York is seven hours away from Finland. There is like one overlapping uh, office hour. Uh, if, you, if you are in West Coast, it's 10 hours time difference. It will be always very difficult to communicate. So. Uh, Bringing the company culture there uh, is, is, the, is the key, and, uh, and then hiring the team there, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's another step then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned employee loyalty. As you go from kind of a you know, five-person team, 20-person team, to a team with over you know, 200 people, how do you maintain that company loyalty? Yeah, that's a uh, change is, is something very, very interesting thing. So I'm a physicist by my background, but it's like a learning to know more about people and, and like a, being like this leaders should be more people centric. They are too often, they are more like technology centric. So uh, uh, how people behave, how they, they form their relationships, 
uh, how, how they communicate. This is, this is very important. And, and one thing what we have uh, found is that, uh, actually you mentioned already earlier, so uh, this recruitment process is, is something where there's a strong bond form between the hiring manager and, and the new employee. And, and uh, so the new employee very often uh, like follows the, the leader. And uh, when the company grows, then uh, there are, might be some stress structuring, so team structures are different, or the company grows, there will be new leaders. And uh, it's very easy to take one employee, put him or her to the another box, and, and it's very easy to do that on, on, on the box level. But uh, it takes actually a lot of time, and it's, in some cases it doesn't happen, that there would be like a new uh, relationship uh, formed between the new leader and, and the employee there. So, uh, actually, uh, that is that is some 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 in some respect we have seen like uh, it changing the organization is actually very difficult afterwards, and uh, that's why let's say the early employees sometimes don't feel so comfortable anymore in a bigger organization where where all these relationships are messed up. Mm -hmm. So they they learn to know that they came they could speak directly to the founder or they could speak to anyone and things happen. But then when there are like 200, 300 people, then it's different. I mean, thinking back about like over all the people that you've hired, do you have an example of like a key hire that you've made that has been pivotal to getting your company to where it is today? Uh, so we have been, yeah, we have had uh, like a lot of examples like uh, of different kind of hiring. So uh, let's say that many of the early employees, they were having like a very technical background and they would, they would prefer to have kind of a individual contributor uh, career track there. Uh, some of them have learned that uh, becoming like a people leader is, is, is good for them and, uh, and they have found comfortable way there. And when, when you're growing like then there is like a Sometimes you get ideas that let's have a, like a professional leader to the position, and uh, uh, we can't find anyone from internally. And, and then you then you end up uh, like uh, hiring some some VPs from some some bigger companies, uh, so ex VPs from bigger companies who are specialized to some topics, and, and putting them to some key positions in the organization, and that's sometimes uh, uh, quite a, quite a surprise how it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the other hand, do you have an example of a hiring decision that went very wrong, or even just a little bit wrong? Uh, yeah, we have done a lot of good hirings, and, and sometimes even it goes surprisingly well. So, uh, uh, since there are like uh, some areas I am not so much a master, but for example, we, we in some point we hired a uh, head of marketing, and, and I just thought that we made a good hiring for head of marketing, and then. Uh, uh, actually, we started to get like a lot of applications for our marketing team, and it turned out that they are actually uh, people want to join the team where there is like a well-known marketeer, mm -hmm. and and uh, so they can they can also attract the talent attracts more talent, and this was kind of effect I didn't expect beforehand. Mm -hmm. So when you have a good concentration of talent, actually it starts to build up and you can get better and better talent to that team since they want to work with the specialists. Yeah. So what would you say were kind of like the, the key lessons that you've learned throughout your hiring experience? If there are like three top takeaways, what would you, what would you say they are? Uh, <clears throat> one of them is, is a gut feeling. So uh, if, you, if you are uh, in a, in a hiring discussions and or the, going through the process. And, 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 and there's a good candidate who is uh, having a great CV and ticking all the boxes and uh, basically giving a good answer to every, uh, every question you are asking. But still your gut feeling says that there is something, something wrong. Uh, some, something is not working. Uh, so usually, like that has been my experience that to follow the gut feeling. So if it doesn't work there in the recruitment process, then it doesn't work later on either. So trust on your gut feeling is the, is the one of those ones. Then the other one is that what we discussed earlier, this loyalty thing. So thinking more about like uh, 
where are the bonds between the people, why people are, are behaving as they are, and uh, don't make too naive uh, decisions, especially when changing the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of looking at early employees versus later employees, are there specific like qualities or um, traits that you see in those people that, that are different from the early versus late? Uh, early on, of course, if you are lucky, you are, can uh, hire like a, like a very experienced expert. But usually at the startup, they are, it's hard to say it, but they are nobody before they have done anything. So it's very hard to attract the experienced people very early on. So uh, usually you get like a very seasoned expert later on you can hire. And when you have uh, already accomplished something, you start to attract uh, those people. Uh, and that, that's clearly, but then like, uh, yeah, my, my feeling was that earlier we, we got like those ones who are like very loyal employees, uh, like a generalist who can do whatever this kind of uh, Swiss army knife people who do say that, okay, let's build a quantum computer and say, okay, let's do it. And then they, after three, four years, it's there. So uh, it's hard to say there are very good employees both, but they are different. Yeah. So as you continue expanding in Asia and the US, do you have to change your hiring practices depending on the region that you're, that you're actually hiring in, so US versus Asia versus Europe? Uh, definitely, uh, and uh, that's like, a, like a, every company has to adapt to the local, local culture, local uh, market. Uh, so, of course, the big surprise, last, like the first one was the, the salary levels, which are like much higher in the US than, than compared to Europe, and, and we have to adapt. Uh, but also like uh, when going to Japan, so talking to Japanese, uh, it's, uh, like they telling that, okay, we thought that we hire a country manager and, and he will put alone everything in the shape. But actually talking to Japanese, they that it's, it, you, you should better to start with five people, uh, five people, how it comes. It's like, but it's in Japanese culture, very hierarchical. Uh, so certain people in certain positions doesn't do necessarily the other job. Whereas we in Europe, especially in Finland, we think it's very flat organization. Everybody should be able to do everything. But it's uh, that those kind of surprises, and you should you should understand every market and not to be too straightforward there. Mm -hmm. So looking at the market now, what do you think are kind of the the main challenges that deep tech startups are facing when it comes to hiring? Uh, uh, there is a shortage of talent when it comes to the really like experts. So we are hiring like in in a, like a quantum market, but I can I can expect that the similar situation is in every other like AI other market. So uh, you have to really fight for the for the best talent. You have to create a company culture which is attractive where people want to work on, uh, and and uh, yeah. And younger generation is is different from from let's say already my generation. So they are appreciating different things and and. You have, to, you have to take all that into account. You have to build uh, diverse teams. You have to think about different cultures and, and all that. And, and uh, you have to spend a lot of time on, on making things right mm -hmm. if you want to have a successful company. Yeah. If you had one piece of advice that you had to give deep tech founders when it comes to hiring, what would it be? Uh, spend enough time on that. It's, uh, it's uh, one of the most important decisions what you do when you hire someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And particularly in the early stages, I guess. Yeah. yeah. That's where it, where it kind of sets the tone for the whole organization from, from the very beginning. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so we, like this company culture values and also then what comes to the practicalities, like a behavior. You should be very careful in the beginning, like which behavior, so you are the role model, which behave, how you behave yourself and which kind of behavior you tolerate from the others. So if there is like a super expert, but uh, the teamwork is not good, then you, you have to make really the decision. I, like, uh, do you let that behavior to continue and, and uh, appreciate only the, let's say, the technical expertise or is the teamwork actually what you want from the team? And 
those kind of uh, big decisions are then having like a lot of consequences later on. So it's the hiring process and then you, how you lead the team uh, afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, just on your last point, what would you say is more important, teamwork or the technical expertise? I think uh, if you want to grow large, then uh, the, the teamwork is the only way to go there. So. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Yuha. This has been incredibly interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Leah.